On today's show, the Heat were up 3-0 over the Celtics. Now the series is 3-2. Is it time to panic in Miami? Plus, are the Nuggets not getting enough media coverage? And which players are we thinking about a little differently after these playoffs? All of that and much more on today's Locked On NBA. You are Locked On NBA, your daily NBA podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome to Locked On NBA. I'm Wes Goldberg here with Adam Maras. However, you might be listening on YouTube, Odyssey, or your favorite podcast app. Thanks so much for making Locked On NBA your first listen every day. Well, the Heat were up 3-0 over the Celtics. Now the series is at 3-2. Teams that have been up 3-0 in a series are 150 and 0 all time. Adam and Chris have not seen that stat over the last couple of days. Might have come uh, up. <laughs> but the Celtics are making the Heat sweat tonight, beating Miami 110-97 to in Boston. The Celtics shooting the lights out. The Heat discombobulated. But uh, I'll throw it to you here. Uh, what do you think has changed over the last couple of games for the Heat or the Celtics? Uh, well, I'll just start with the Heat. <laughs> it's just so reductive. It's so simple. It's the basic thing. They're playing so much harder. This is a team that has faced elimination a handful of times already. And the desperation of tonight, I mean, you had guys hitting the deck, you know, diving for loose balls. The urgency was clearly there. Forget what people tell you. I think it's difficult to manufacture urgency, mm -hmm. even in the playoffs. I know people will say, well, it's the playoffs. Don't you play hard? Yeah, but it's just a little different when you know if you lose, you go home versus you know you have a couple right. more uh, opportunities. You're talking so, about the Celtics. You, what's that? You're talking about the Celtics, right? I'm talking about the Celtics. Yeah, like, I yeah, mean, yeah. the Celtics just had the urgency tonight, had the belief. Uh, and and had the intensity that I thought separated them. In Miami, this is two games in a row. Yes, they were shorthanded, but to me, that's a kind of a big part of it is they can't lose. They might lose the game with winning the hustle battle, but tonight mm -hmm. I thought they lost the hustle battle. They looked like the Celtics did in game three when we were critiquing the Celtics for letting go of the rope and mentally yeah. breaking and just folding in that game in a way that I think surprised everybody uh, and just, you know, frankly, just being soft, right? Like they were a soft team in game three and, and there was really no excuse for that. And I look at this game for Miami and I said, there's no excuse for what they did in this game five in Miami. Right. Look, you or in Boston, I'm sorry, you lose game four in Miami. And I think that that wasn't surprising. I think it was more surprising in how it is that they lost um, and, and the blowout nature of it. And I'm not necessarily surprised that they lost this one against the Celtics either, given that it was in Boston. <laughs> but I am, again, surprised by how they lost. Just absolutely no fight. Uh, they talked a big talk after game four. Hey, we got to come out in game five with more urgency. You know, we expected this. Our, you know, their backs are against the wall. This is going to happen. But we we got to set the tone early. And I'm not, I'm not even sure they got off the plane in Boston. This is a, a, a complete no-show by the Heat from the very first, like, three turnovers in the, th in the first three minutes for them. Um, yeah. well, you know, 16, 16 overall, by the way, is too many, like the, way too this many. eight in the playoffs, 16 is, and 16 just unforced on, like I will, I give credit to the Celtics quite a bit for forcing some of them, but a lot of unforced ones, just bobbling the ball, kind of like a, a receiver looking, looking ahead before bringing the ball in. It was like a lot of those kinds of things for Bam out of bio in particular with six turnovers for him, Kyle Lowry with four turnovers, Lowry getting the start over Gabe Vincent should be mentioned. Gabe Vincent late scratch, um, before the game with an ankle injury. That he that he sustained in Game Four, his status for the rest of the series is a little questionable now. Um, but Larry, like, I don't know. There's a play early in this game where he comes off of the screen and gets into that wide open mid range jumper that's been his sweet spot for a decade now, and just uh, rises up to take it, and then for some reason gets cold feet and, and tries to like in the air squeeze a pass to Kevin Love between three different Celtics defenders and that's oh. uh, uh and, and it was just another one of those early turnovers and I'm like what's going on here and I felt like that set the tone in the wrong way for the rest of the 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 night for Miami it was just disjointed offense not really knowing what they wanted to do and for so much of these playoffs the heat I gave him credit for okay if plan A didn't work they had a plan B they had a plan C they had a plan D and tonight it felt like once plan A didn't happen they just had no other way to go about their offense. It was it was it was the the worst game I've seen them play in these playoffs. And I will give the Celtics credit for for a lot of that. But this the Heat have been able to overcome so many of these things in the past. Do you think though that there might be a sign of losing some mojo? Because let's be honest, I mean the Miami Heat are on a magical run, but it also feels a little bit like you know a perfect storm. And and I I feel like 
maybe you're different covering this heat as closely as you are. But I feel like I'm waiting for the shoe to drop, right? I'm just waiting for them. And now that it's been two games in a row where they haven't even gotten up enough threes, uh, you know, a lot of threes to begin with. Yeah. And then where they're tonight. Yeah. yeah, just 23. So I, I do feel at all like they might have lost a little bit of the mojo. Or do you feel like, come on, it's just as Eric Spolster said after the game, every game has its own, like nothing carries over. Every game's different. Do you kind of feel that way? Or do you feel like they've lost a little momentum? I have been waiting for the shooter drop and I was yeah. waiting for it to happen against the Knicks, but then they shot 30% from three against the Knicks and they found other ways to win. Now the Knicks are sort of an uh, above average team and the Celtics for most of the regular season have been an elite team. Right. And so it is a different competition, but I'm, I, I guess I'm, it, it's not so much the shoe dropping that, that is surprising to me. It, it's just the, the, how they folded so early, just the, like the one thing you can always count on, or used to always be able to count on before this game was that they were going to play hard. And it just didn't feel right. like they, they were playing hard or with intent uh, the way that they, they were always the smarter, harder playing team. I they just weren't always the more talented team. And I thought eventually that the, the talent gap would be too great to overcome with trying hard, right? And but but in this one, they didn't even it didn't even feel like they came out with that urgency that they talked about having. And so that's where I'm more coming from uh, in terms of uh, that. Like I don't know if that the shoe is going to drop, but the other part of this too is like you're up three zero. Like yeah. you dropping now would be a very heavy. Shoe, the point. biggest. <laughs> it, would, it would be the biggest shoe. That's a Shaquille O'Neal shoe, yeah. Of the NBA, it's the shoe of all shoes. <laughs> the shoe of all shoes to drop. <laughs> um, I mean, now you have a couple questions, though. I mean, look, you mentioned the the what was that, 178 and O when it when leading three O something 150 like that. 150 and O, yeah, but whatever. 150. All 178 doesn't matter. It's a yeah, 150. Thing. How many of those have forced a game seven? Because I think, or even a game six, to be fair, like. It's pretty rare even to get to this point. So we're already yeah. in a little bit of uncharted territory. But then the big question. And also the like, fact that the Celtics were the higher seed. Usually when it's a 3-0, right. it's the other way. Right, right. That's that's right. But I but now you have two questions. You know, the Tyler Hero question and the Gabe Vincent question. Do you have any insight on any of those? And if both are available for Game 6, how do you manage that? How do you make that call? Uh, I I do not think that Tyler will be available for Game 6. I'll just so okay. I'll say that right away. Um, and I, from what I'm hearing on the Gabe Vincent front, I, I, there is absolutely no ruling on him. I think it's a little bit more on the side of like questionable, doubtful than it is oh, no. with oh, him no. for game six, but it's an ankle and it's, and, and again, you never really know how he thought he was going to play. I talked to him right after game uh, four when he injured it and he was like, nah, I'm good. And he had nothing around his ankle and I believed him. And then the next, and then uh, yeah. on Thursday morning, it was like his, it just, these ankles, you really never know how they're going to respond. And you give it 36 hours and it's, it, and it kind of just feels completely different. So it's very much up in the air. Uh, I think it's much closer, like 50 50, maybe even 60 40 that he doesn't play at this point, but it could change yeah. in a hurry uh, with these ankles. Uh, so, yeah, I, I the other part too is that with the Tyler Hero injury, now the Gabe Vincent one, you already had the Victor Oladipo one. Uh, Jimmy Butler obviously not looking the same after turning his ankle in that Knicks series. It's just like a lot of injuries piling up on this team that was already short on depth in the first place. And the Celtics, I know Malcolm Brogdon's dealing with an elbow thing, but for they are much deeper right now than Miami is, and so that's the other part of this. Now the Heat's bench outscored uh, Boston's bench tonight, but that was more just sort of like. Boston's bench didn't need to score, so they didn't try. And, and Miami's bench really needed to score, and, and they were in the game for a lot of minutes because the starters were so bad. Um, so I don't know where they. I, I think if we're going to just talk about Game Six, I think this is a must-win for the Miami Heat. You can't go back to Game Seven in Boston. Um, that's going to be a really tough spot for a team that's already sort of limping right now. Um, but don't you feel, Wes? I mean, you know this team better. Because I hear everybody saying that, and I understand it. You give a team three games in a row to win, like they have momentum, they have confidence, you get the home crowd. But wouldn't that kind of be this Miami team? Is it possible that they have gone possible. from the most doubted team ever to being the you know the front runners, and they just suck at being the front runners? Just do it as hard as possible. This is yeah. a, a bigger scale version of the playing tournament. We're like, we could just beat the Hawks and get in. Yes. Or... Or I mean, honestly, does it not fit the mo that it'd be like? Hold on, they were up three zero. Now the easy part is putting them away. No, that's yeah. the hard part. As a couple of content creators, it's great content. But um, <laughs> <laughs> look, I wouldn't put it past them, and I actually don't think home court advantage matters that much in this series, considering that 
these have been like they've they've gone back and forth between these arenas in three of the last four eastern conference finals it's like home away from home for both of these teams but uh that's the part i'm worried about is the momentum that you're giving boston and the confidence because the only edge that miami has in this it's not the talent edge they do not have the talent edge they have the mental edge they have like hey we are the gritty team you're the soft team and if you take that away from miami I don't really, and you give now confidence to a Boston Celtics team that when they're confident, they look like they did the first three weeks of the season where they had the greatest offense in the history of the league, right? Like that's now where you're kind of not just like the rope's not slipping. You've kind of lost it. And I don't know that there's a like a, a way to get that back. Now it can change in a hurry. You can have one good quarter from three point range if you're the heat. And now you're feeling good about yourselves and, and now you're rolling. But I need to see a lot more in game six from Jimmy Butler and Bam Adebayo in particular, those guys got to be better. Jimmy, just 14 points in this one, Bam, 16 points, but, but six turnovers. Um, and then I think we're going to see a starting lineup change. Kevin Love will not be the starting power forward in game six. It'll probably be either Caleb Martin or the way Spo started the second half, Haywood Highsmith at that four spot. Yeah. But it feels like they need to be a little bit more nimble defensively uh, to start these games. But um, yeah, I mean, that starting lineup gave up a lot and some of this was hot shooting. Right. But but they still gave up a lot of points. That's the thing. It wasn't even that hot of shooting over the last couple. I mean, they shot 41 percent from three point range. The the, the Celtics are shooting 40 uh, yeah. percent from three over the last two games. They shot 39 percent in the regular season from three. Like that's not. Yeah, it's not, it's that, not that much, that much of an outlier. outlier. It's more regular. Like the first three games are more of an outlier for Boston. Like I expect it to be more like this, you know. I just it's such I mean we go in we're going through all these details and just we're I have finally a hard... the series that we expected. You got a Celtics team well. shooting well, playing good defense, and, and and if you can get a Heat team that could do the things that they're supposed to be doing in terms of the execution, the working hard, and all that kind of stuff, that's that's more of what I think we expected. But right now we've got two outlier games by Miami, three outlier games on the on the on the other end of it by Boston, and you end up with a three two series. Yeah. Do you, I mean, but you just said high Smith, like might start or might play more. Like, Not is great. this, yeah, I just, I, I don't know. Like that, that, that scares me. It's a scary thing. <laughs> That's where we are. Uh, it's not like, like I, I said this on locked on heat already, but you, you look at the options. It's like another undrafted guy you're gonna have to rely on. I'm like, there's no first round picks just sitting on the bench waiting to be played. Right. This is it. Like, this is the group. Right. Um, Coming up, the Nuggets media coverage has been a hot topic lately. How should the media talk about a team that's in the finals? We're going to talk about that next. But first, today's episode of Locked on NBA is brought to you by Game Time. Buying tickets to your favorite events shouldn't be stressful. Game Time is the fast and easy way to buy tickets for all the sports, music, comedy, and theater near you. With killer deals on last-minute tickets and their best price guarantee, you could stop stressing over the tickets and just start getting hyped for the fun. That you're gonna have. Forget planning months in advance. Game time has deals on tickets right up to the day of the event. Get exclusive flash deals on tickets for football, basketball, baseball, concerts, comedy, theater, and more. The game time guarantee means you'll always get the best price if you find the ticket in the same section and row for less. Game time will credit you 110% of the difference. Get images of your seat before you buy so you know exactly what to expect when you arrive. Buy tickets in a matter of seconds, two taps, and you're all set. Tickets are sent directly to your phone, so you're never going to have to dig through your email or print anything. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use the code LOCKEDONNBA for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account, redeem the code LOCKEDONNBA for $20 off. Download Game Time today. Last-minute tickets. Lowest price. Guaranteed. Thanks for making Locked On NBA your first listen every day. We're going to get to the biggest risers in the NBA playoffs here in a minute. But first, uh, in case you missed it, Sports Illustrated's Chris Mannix in a podcast said that the reason that the Nuggets aren't covered that much is because they aren't interesting to talk or write about. Now, this, of course, put the internet in a tizzy. Uh, And I think, uh, Adam, for our purposes, it's just a good entry point into a more interesting topic considering that these Nuggets are in the finals. Um, What do you think about the comment uh, the reaction and just the general discourse around the Nuggets uh, in the media. Well, first of all, I know what it's like to be live every day. I know what it's like to talk every day. Every now and then, you say something dumb. <laughs> you say something wrong. I'll give him a little bit of a. I you know he's backtracked a little bit. He's kind of stepped up and said, "Okay, okay, okay." You know, I get it. But at the same time, there is the broader sentiment of 
Well, the Nuggets just aren't interesting because they don't have a LeBron on their team. They don't have a you know a Steph Curry, Draymond, this or that. And to me, it's absolutely ridiculous. They, the Nuggets have been an interesting team for several years, and they have a long form story arc that extends all the way back to 2018 when they lost in Game 82 to Jimmy Butler and the Minnesota Timberwolves when they were it was they were scheduled to make the playoffs. Meaning, when you project the young team, mm-hmm. it was like that's the year. That team still has a through line to this one, and every year they've kind of gotten better, went through purgatory, obviously, with Jamal Murray getting hurt. But to me, there are so many storylines that are just underreported. It's not that they're boring. It's just that they take a little bit of digging. I said on a show earlier, to be a good journalist requires soft eyes. You've got to be able to look at a situation, look at a team, look at a season, and see it for what it is. Where is the good story? There's a good story in every team. There is a story to be told. So to say that the team that is in the championship that features this five-year arc to get here is boring to me is absolutely ridiculous. Um, yeah, I, I I thought the the specific to the manic stuff. I thought it was blown out of proportion. It's I I get bothered when people just start dunking on a dude on social media because it's just really easy, and I just I'm not interested. That's how Twitter works. Every day there's like a a main character and a mood that you have to use to talk about that guy. Right. I logged off today. Yeah, like, it was disappointment. This. We're all disappointed in Chris Mannix. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I was just like, all right, like cool. Like, I guess you're, I guess you have nothing but great opinions all the time about every team. But <laughs> right. you know, it's just, um, look, I, I get what he was trying to say. Even if he went, I think the Nuggets are fascinating. You and I talk about the Nuggets a lot, not as much as you do in your life, but I, I love every time you and I had a chance to talk about the Nuggets on, on Locked On NBA. I was I was giddy because I get to your I get to hear your insight, your expertise on the team, and then I get to watch them. And I would think in my top three league pass teams, the Nuggets were up there. They they might have been number one. I didn't chart it necessarily, but they might. I love watching Jokic, and I've loved them for a long time. I remember writing a piece like right around 2019 about how like they might be the future of the NBA. Like I right. love this team, and I've been I've been bought in for a long time. Uh, Jamal Murray, love him too. Love his game. Love everything about how he plays. Um, but they're like to the regular NBA fan. I don't know that they are that interesting because it's not that it's not enough. And, and and it's sort of chicken or the egg. Like whose fault is Correct. that? Are not enough stories being told about them? But I just know this: being good isn't enough to be interesting, right? Like the Dallas Cowboys are on ESPN every day, not because they're good, but because they're not good, and people wonder why, and they have a huge fan base. Like I, I, the Spurs were good. They've won decades across, or they've won championships across two decades, and they were never really talked about. Uh, and people, I don't think the Warriors are interesting well, well, and get I, great TV ratings here's, because here's they're the good. Thing. I think it's because yeah. of the Kevin Durant thing was polarizing. Like, there's nothing. I guess the most polarizing thing about the Denver Nuggets was like the MVP race, right? And that was just like the the weird shades and undertones of racial. That was the only story, though, Wes. I push back on it. That was the only story about the Nuggets. There was only one: is Jokic the MVP or not? That's the only right. story. It was the and only so, one. So when you said, you know, it's chicken and egg. This is this is my thing. There are great stories. They often take a little more effort. The stories that I think Chris Mannix is talking about is more like player demanded trade. Right. Players that's what I'm saying. Fight. And that's what I think regular people like care. If I think regular people care about that, and for instance, like, well, I'm let me give treat- you. Well, let- Nobody's well, asking you. me, like, did you see what Joker did last night? They're always saying, do you think the Lakers can win it? Where's Kyrie going? Can you believe that Durant went to Phoenix? Like, I, I like that's kind of what normal well, like, regular people talk about. So last time, you know, the Nuggets faced the Phoenix Suns in the playoffs. They got swept. And a lot of people said, well, how much of a difference could one player make? It's Jamal Murray. He's not even an all-star. How much of a difference can he make? Well, you go into this series, Denver wins in a commanding six-game series, and that provides a little context. Number one, there is a rivalry that is inherent in there that the fan bases know about, Phoenix and Denver. That was a very contentious series in part because of the fan bases, but in part because there was a revenge factor to it. The Los Angeles Lakers, same thing. Denver has a history with Anthony Davis. Four years ago, Anthony Davis outdueled Nikola Jokic in the bubble. He was the better player. Four years later, it's a sweep. And that was a knockout punch from Nikola Jokic in the head-to-head. That's another storyline that I think is very clear and present and easy to tell. And then lastly, you know, you've got a player in Michael Porter Jr. coming off of three back surgeries. To me, he's the best story of the Nuggets and nobody's really talked about it. A guy coming off of three back surgeries who was a star player who has now accepted and excels in being a role player 
despite the fact that by all accounts, this guy sees himself as a star, has star, you know, uh, skill set, albeit underdeveloped, but he can be that. And instead has decided after three back surgeries has decided this is the route for me. I'm going to do it this way and is thriving in it. To me, that's a great story. And then lastly, if you want to do another one, let's do this. What did everybody say was going to happen to the Nuggets in this playoffs? Let's see if they can defend. Mm-hmm. They're good. Jokic can't really defend. Once can't the playoffs come, pick and roll. Yeah. spam pick and roll, man. They're just going to put them in it. That hasn't happened. Why? Why hasn't that happened? What's the story there? And what does it tell us about the NBA at large? And and Jamal Murray missing basically two years and coming back and looking maybe better than he's ever has before. I mean, I'm with you, man. I I love this stuff. I, I eat all this stuff up, but I'm just, I think like the regular person who just wants to talk about, like just have something on first take and, and click on a headline or something like good. Isn't good enough that you need polarizing. And I don't think that there's any, like, I, I, I would say that if Kevin Durant never went to the Warriors, they're not nearly as interesting as they are right now. They don't have the TV ratings that they are right now, but you had the whole bus rider thing with Kevin Durant, right? Like you had that whole thing, like, do these rings count? And that was the polarizing topic with LeBron. You've got the Michael Jordan thing, right? Like the, the biggest sports here's, bar here's, argument about basketball is who do you got LeBron or MJ? Who's the goat? Like, I don't, about, I just don't how, know what the polarizing about, right, let's topic talk, is. Let's, talk, let's talk, talk goat for a second. Who's the leading scorer left in the NBA? But Adam, you're talking about just players being good. What's well, the no, polarizing no, no, I'm thing about, about the Nuggets? Players being historically good is the, is the point Still here. Because you were saying, are you going to argue that Jokic, is it Jokic versus Michael Jordan? No. Is it Jokic versus LeBron James? I mean, here's one of the stories that was missed. LeBron James, part of the reason people thought part of the part of the reason people thought LeBron or the Lakers were going to beat the Nuggets was because Jokic was this fake superstar and LeBron was this real one. And by the way, LeBron, great in that series. Fantastic in that series. Amazing. Adds to the legacy, doesn't subtract. Distant second best player in that series. Yep. And so one story, and it was so much so that after the game, he flirts with retirement or does this or that. One of the stories to me is that Jokic is in the LeBron mold of player, meaning he does everything. He sets the table on every possession. He's not just a score. Mm-hmm. He's a score. That's also a passer and that's everything goes through him. So one of them to one storyline to me is you have a two time MVP whose advanced stats tell us is a top 10 player of all time, but he has never proven to be that, you know, in the playoffs to this point. And he's going up against the guy who is the goat of an era on his last legs. Is this, I think if this was not Jokic, but was instead Anthony Edwards or Zion, Zion Williamson or Jason Tatum, this would be billed as a changing of the guard, right? Oh, the next great player came and took it from the previous one. We never talked about that. Why not? I'll tell you this, Wes. It might be a changing of the guard. This might be if Denver goes on into and wins the NBA Finals and Jokic averages 30 points, 13 rebounds, 10 assists on hyper efficiency. I'm going to tell you right now what I'm going to say as soon as that's over. We have entered the Jokic era of the NBA. So to me to say it's not interesting, that story is right in front under our noses. I'm so glad you hit on this and I want to distill it down to a few words. Exactly what you said. I agree with everything you just said. Is Jokic the best player in the NBA now? I that's, think so. I mean, that's you got to But that's that's your sports bar argument now. Regardless, right. even even right. if they lose in the finals, I don't even care. That the what the this postseason he just had, he is firmly in that conversation. I haven't given it enough thought to think of I'm if I think he's number one, but he's definitely I mean, who's ahead of like here's the thing, thing is who's but who that's are the suspects? sports bar argument now. And so, but right. I, I'm gonna say the biggest thing about Jokic was the MVP thing, but that's like a month, two month conversation. And again, the but racial MVP's undertones different. were always uncomfortable. Nobody wanted to talk about it. Blow that up to bigger scale, not MVP. Forget who cares about MVP. Regular right, 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 nobody right. cares. Jokic doesn't even care. Right. Is he the best player in the league? Right. Period. And now you're now you're pinning him against established stars who do get this attention: LeBron, Steph, etc., Kevin Durant, Giannis, well, etc. But like the thing that I. The thing that I will say that bothers me about the whole thing is they need to be on TV more. And and the journalistic enterprises nationally, like the Denver Post, you guys, like you guys are doing your job. You guys are doing your job and it's great. Um, but like <laughs> the bigger, like national scale, like like there is a, I think, a, a professional obligation to cover this team more than they are, regardless of what is interesting, right? If you If you fashion yourself a journalistic enterprise, right? Like you need to be doing better. And and I think you need to be providing that content to fans. But I'm just like this idea of Joker maybe being the best Jokic being the best player in the NBA, that gets people talking in a bar. That works. I'll give you two more. One of them is 
are Jokic and Murray the best duo in the NBA? Because I think coming in, people would have said, I don't know, Harden and Embiid, Davis and uh, LeBron, KD and Booker. Well, two of those Jokic is already and Murray have already gone through, and one of mm. them is out, went out sad in the second round. I think they are the best duo. So best player, best duo. And then let's talk about Jamal Murray. 28 points per game on 50, 40, 90, 90 shooting in the playoffs so far. A guy who's never sniffed an all-star team, Wes. Not that he hasn't made one. He wasn't a reserve. He wasn't the next guy picked when other guys got hurt. We talk about Jimmy Butler. He's one of the big storylines of the whole NBA because he has the 50, what was it, 57? Is that what, what did he 56 get? 56 in Milwaukee. 56. Yeah. He had the 56-point game, and I think that alone, on top of all the other things, the great things he did, but sometimes it takes the one game that elevates it. For sure. But Murray, to me, the story has been Jimmy Butler, man. Don't talk trash to that guy. That's a guy that when it comes to the clutch, who else would you rather have? Jamal Murray has been insanely clutch in these playoffs. I think Murray and Butler are cut from the same cloth mentally. Mm -hmm. Guys that you do not whisper in their ear, don't even look at them the wrong way because that gets them going. But again, if you ask the average person, if you ask Chris Mannix that, that, he he was not, uh, he's not like Jimmy Butler. Are you watching? I'm with you, man. I love Did that you see dude. the fourth quarter of game three? I, lo- I, I love Jamal Murray. I agree 100% with you. He's cut from the same cloth. That, that dude is an mf man. And I, I, I actually almost... Big game player. I was actually going to... I was going to try to out-hot take myself. I was going to say, I actually like watching him more than I do Jokic. And I was like, no, I don't. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but right there, I, I, love that, I love that duo. Um, they're unbelievable. I'm with you. I wish more people talked about the Nuggets. I just, I, I, I just understand the off-online conversation. I just think that there needs to be more of a polarizing sort of news peg for your average person. And, and I, th- and I, I think, and I hope, and it's too late, but I think, but better late than never. And I, I hope we're getting there, especially with this team in the finals, like we got to get there. Uh, and I think it is on everybody in the media in general to cover this teams. This, if we are recording history as NBA media people, like we got to do a good job of recording this, regardless if it's Lakers Celtics, or Nuggets versus whoever comes out of the East. So again, um, again, if I just said this, Jamal Murray right now, but you know we do player rankings. That's that's the com- the layman's conversation. I think Jamal yeah. Murray was like fifty eighth or something this year. You know, halfway through it. Right now, you look at it and say, "Well, Devin where Booker, you put him? Huh? power rankings, Jamal Murray, where? Top well, this, this is, he's hard to rank. This is part of why the conversation's fun. But here's my point: you start to stack up and say. Does he have a better re- playoff team resume? Not individual, but team resume right now. It's right there with Booker. Booker went to one finals. Murray has now been to a conference finals, game seven of the conference semifinals, and the NBA finals. Three Not times in the playoffs. Time. Every single time it has been a deep playoff run for him. So now you start to look at players like that and say, okay, what, you know, where does he stack up to? That's a player that everybody says is great. Trey Young you know, is great. Well, his resume is not quite like Murray's in the playoffs just yet in terms of team success. So to me, that's the that's interesting. A, you know what? If you if you ask the again, just sort of casual fan, and I, I'm not trying to dunk on casual fans, but I'm just you know I'm using it as a as an avatar here. But would you rather have Trey Young or, or Jamal Murray? I think what 95 percent of casual fans would say Trey Young just because he's like the bigger star, quote unquote yeah. star, right? And I think if you a- ask anybody who watches this league and covers this league closely or is just paying attention, just a, a fan that loves league pass, you know? Right. I think most of them would say Jamal Murray, right? I think I, like I, a basketball I, aficionado would say Jamal Murray. So he's having a, I mean, to be fair, Trey Young's having a little bit of a rough go at the moment, but yeah, you know, I mean, Jalen Brunson, it. John Morant, uh, you know, Desmond Bain, even, I think there would have been, if you would have done this th- two months ago, people may, I don't know. Bain might be better than Jamal Murray right now. It's like, no, who do you want to go into battle with? Who's a better mm-hmm. foxhole guy than Jamal Murray, right? That's not the way you would say it. Because better, the 82-game sample size still matters a lot. But if you say mm-hmm. foxhole guy, like how many guards are you taking in the foxhole yeah. over Which Jamal Murray? Which guy do you Murray? want on your team? Which guy do you want on your team? You want Trey Young or Jamal Murray? And, and then you go just go down the list of guys, you know, uh, Donovan Mitchell, you know. Um, mm, that one's a little tougher. You know, even James Harden, to be honest with you. Like, See, I like this conversation. This is good. This is good bar. This is good yeah. bar room. Uh, do you do this? So the, that's the my NBR, only point. The Jamal NBR Murray, bar. all all first team, all foxhole guy. All foxhole and guy. It's part of why. Uh, is De'Aaron why, Fox in the foxhole guy team? You know, he kind of is. I mean, we I might talk about him in the next segment. Clutch player award. Yeah. We've talked a lot about reputations. We're going to talk about more reputations next. But first, today's episode of Locked on NBA is brought to you by. 
bird dogs. Look, I look better and I feel great when wearing these bird dogs. Locked on was kind enough to send us a bunch of pairs of these. Uh, and I love them. And Honestly, I already owned like three or four pairs before they sent us them. Their stretchy fabric makes my legs look great. They're comfier than my other shorts and my other pants. They give me the freedom to wear one pair of shorts on the golf course to a meeting at a date, hanging out with friends. I wear them in the pool, Adam, and then I get out of the pool. And in this South Florida weather, in like 43 seconds, they're dry again. And I can just keep wearing them for the rest of the day. So, uh, so go to birddogs.com slash locked on NBA to get yourself a pair. And better yet, when you enter the promo code Locked On NBA, they're going to throw in a free custom Bird Dogs Yeti style tumbler with every order. Thanks again for making Locked On NBA your first listen every day. It's time to count down to the weekend with our weekly power rankings. Adam, what do you have for us today? Today, I've got players who have risen the most in the playoffs, their stock has risen the most. And I got to start with my honorable mentions here, of which there are quite a few. Got to give a shout out to the Jokic stopper, Rui Hachimura. Guy Love is it. shooting an unbelievable percentage. And there was a brief moment when everybody thought Rui Hachimura might be better than Anthony Davis on defense <laughs> against Jokic. But he has had a very good playoffs. Um, Bruce Brown, Denver Nuggets. The, the, he seems to be one of the – I think he's going to be – when we talk about real winners – since he's a up for a contract, I think he's going to be actual winner here. And that I think he might have made an extra 20, 25 million dollars for himself during this playoff run, which is, you know, of course, always great. Um, I'll give you two guys here for your squad: Caleb Martin and Gabe Vincent. Caleb Martin, I think, at one point had the highest plus minus in the NBA. I don't know if that's still true or not. I don't know, but he's a plus like twenty five or was coming into tonight in this series and wasn't starting for some reason, which I've it's a separate gripe. That's a different topic, maybe a separate segment. We talked enough about the heat in the first segment, but I love Gabe Vincent making an appearance on your list. I'm a little surprised he's not in your top five because I think that dude, free agent, talk about making money. That dude made himself some money. Yeah, you're right. Actually, him, Bruce Brown, and the guy the guy I actually put ahead of him. Maybe, maybe I shouldn't have. And then Malik Monk went out in the first round, but boy, did he have himself a series. Um only reason he probably would have been on, on the top five if he would have just made one more round at that level. Yeah, but yeah. that guy was unbelievable. All star level for a handful of games. Getting there. to the basket, too. I mean, that was the thing that took the Warriors by surprise. It's not just, hey, <laughs> hot shooting for a series. Like that guy, that yeah. guy was good on offense. All right. And then the last honorable mention here is a little crazy Devin Booker. His stock mm. was already so high, but this is how high, how well he played. First of all, a game with 20 of 25, and another game of shooting, and another game with. 14 of 18. Yeah, didn't miss a shot for like a week and a half. It was crazy. Yeah, two games in a row where he just didn't miss shots. And then on top of that, he was better than Kevin Durant in this playoffs. Yep. He was better than Kevin Durant. Mm -hmm. I just, he his stock rose because. And I the mean, way, I, if we're talking about reputations, the way we think about players, right? I'm like, right. I'm coming away from these playoffs. I'm like, is he the 1A on is Phoenix? He top, yeah. Well, I will say it this way. Is he a top 10 player? I think he that is. he's going to have an I'm argument there. for being I'm a there with him. top 10 full stop. Let's not even argue it. He's there. And that means there's going to be a good player behind you take him. him or Jamal Murray. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Now we get into the real top five. I hate myself for number five. My top four, unassailable. Wes, unassailable. My, my number five is a little sketchy. I went with Austin Reeves. He, the Penguin. He was the third best Lakers player. And you could make an argument a part of the big three for rounds one and two. <laughs> he cooled off in round in round three, of course, as they got swept. But I mean, he was legitimate. He's also a guy that's going to make some money this offseason. But he was a legitimate third option for the Lakers in some pretty impressive wins. There's a lot of debate about how good he is. I'm with you. He was their third best player for most yeah. of these playoffs. There was like moments of Hachimura there, <laughs> to yeah. your point. But yeah. Uh, he's going to be a free agent. Uh, I know that there's reporting out of Los Angeles that the Lakers have every intent to keep him, but like the restricted free agency part, they're going to have to match offers. I'm very wow. curious what those initial offer sheets are coming in at because, you know, there's some people that think that he's he could be an all-star one day, and there's I, I don't know really what the, the outlook on him is, but um, he was really good in those playoffs. I, I'd want him back if I were the Lakers. They, they need him back. They need all the yeah. help they can get, to be honest with you. Um, number four to me, De'Aaron Fox, another guy out in the first round. So it, otherwise he could have been a lot higher, but my goodness, do people look at De'Aaron Fox differently than they did going into it? That was a hell of a performance in round one. Um, got to tip your hat to him. I mean, he out Steph Curry for the first half of the series. Yep. Uh, he was the best player in that series until he broke a finger. 
Yeah. He was. I mean, he, I think, earned a lot of respect yeah. uh, going into next year. Definitely. Number three for me, this one's a weird one. I went with the two-time MVP, Nikola Jokic. Now, you could say, hold on a second. I am going to say, hold on a second. I'm going to do, I do the applause button because I'm supposed to. But yeah. hold on a second. Let's hold on a second. Now, here's the thing, Wes, and I'm mired in it, right, covering Denver. He's a two-time MVP. He got the respect. But what did everybody say? Coming into this playoffs, why can't he get a third one? Well, one for historical precedent. But two, how are we going to look when we get into the playoffs and they lose in the first round? How are they going to look when he gets outplayed by Anthony Davis? How's he going to look when he goes up against Kevin Durant? You know who I would rather take, Kevin Durant, than Nikola Jokic. Jokic murdered everyone in this playoffs. Anthony Davis, that series, we forget because it was a sweep. Game one was billed as this series is going to be mano a mano. Jokic versus Anthony Davis. Best offense versus best defense. How's it going to happen? It lasted one game, Wes. And they said, that's not the plan. We got to take Anthony Davis off. He can't guard that guy one-on-one. -on -one. We have to do something else. So to me, Jokic went from an MVP that still hadn't won people over to almost, almost silencing all doubters. So to me, again, it's harder to quantify, but I just think that Jokic has looked at so differently right now than he was eight weeks ago by a large percentage of the uh, the doubters. I think you're right. And the one thing we didn't get to in the last segment about Jokic is uh, funny how in these in these media scrums after the games, you'll 